Today in the show, we're going to be talking about Miko Minoru of The Runaways. If you didn't know that at one point, she becomes her own blood sacrifice when she loses her arm so she can get a magical replacement arm, then this show is for you. Quick disclaimer, I did do a full history of The Runaways a few weeks ago, so if you want to know about the team as a whole, please watch that. But this video is going to be way more focused on Nico rather than the team as a whole. So every year, Nico's parents would get together with five other couples who all formed a group called The Pride, and Nico and all these other couples' kids would be stuck in a gaming room in the wildest house, and they would all be super bored every single year. Like, they all hated this. One year, Nico turns up and she's super into gothic fashion, she's like making her own clothes, it's really Really cool. The kids are bored as usual, but then Alex turns around and reveals that he knows about a secret passage that they can actually use to spy on their parents. All the kids go through the secret passage, and Nico actually sees her own parents doing some kind of magical enchantment while this blood sacrifice happens. All the kids freak out at this, they actually scream, the parents hear them scream, so the kids run through the passageway, manage to make it back to the gaming room, and stage a game of Twister. That night, the five oldest of the six kids, so the only one that doesn't turn up is Molly, all meet up at the Griffith Observatory, and they're like, right, we need to call the police, and they try calling the police, and the police don't believe the kids. So the kids are like, right, we need to get evidence against our parents. The kids start going from house to house. At Gertrude's house, they find a genetically engineered dinosaur that is connected to Gertrude telepathically. At Carolina's house, they find out that Carolina's actually an alien with these psychedelic rainbow sun powers. And eventually, they get to the Steins' house. And this is when their parents turn up. And Nico's mother actually goes to jam a staff into Nico's chest, but Nico's body absorbs it. The kids manage to escape with the help of Carolina's newfound powers. And later, when the kids go to save Molly, who's being held captive by her own parents, Nico would actually be cut in a fight, and this causes the staff of one to emerge from her body, and she says freeze, and this causes the Yorks to freeze in place. This is how Nico finds out that she is actually a witch that has the power to summon the staff of one whenever she gets cut, and she can do any spell she wants just by saying her desired outcome but she can only use a spell once. The kids would save Molly from her parents, and that's when all the other couples call the kids up and are like, look at the TV. And the kids look at the TV and it turns out they are being framed for the murder of destiny. And their parents are like, if you hand yourselves in, all of this can go away. The kids don't hand themselves in because Chase knew about this buried mansion that was in a cave, so the kids just go and live there. In fact, all the kids other than Alex take on new names, and Nico takes on the name Sister Grimm because it was her AIM screen name. The kids would have a series of misadventures through the initial Runaways book, and Nico didn't do much independently outside of the tougher vampire storyline. Basically, what happened here was the kids happened to be at a convenience store while it was being robbed. The kids saved the store, and then they turn around to this kid that was with these two robbers, and he was like, sorry, my parents are evil, they were making me rob things. And the kids allow him to join the runaways. This kid's name is Toffer, and before long, he reveals that he's a vampire, and he wants to take Nico's life. So then Carolina actually stands up for Nico and is like, you know what, if you're gonna take anyone's life, take mine, because I don't want to live. Because she's really like, an emotional wreck over the fact her parents are evil. So he bites into Carolina and dies then and there because Carolina's blood is infused with solar energy. But things eventually peak when it turns out there's a mole in the runaways. And this mole would tell the Pride where the runaways have been hiding out so that LAPD, who are being controlled by the Pride, would turn up at the runaways hideaway. The kids collapse the cave in on themselves. Molly punches them away out and the kids decide enough is enough. They are going to finally confront their parents Parents, and they find out about something called the Rite of Thunder, which is happening in the Marine Vivarium. The Marine Vivarium is basically this temple to the Gibberim that exists underwater. Nico actually casts a spell that, like, lets them go in a bubble to the Marine Vivarium, but before this happens, she actually kisses Alec. And it was actually really sweet because it was a long time coming. Like, you could feel it coming for the duration of the entire book. Like, Alex was really jealous of Toffer because Nico had a huge crush on him. Yeah, it was sort of like a, oh my god, finally! Finally, it's happened. It was great. Chase wouldn't even make it to the parents, though. He is taken out by a sentry golem. So when all the other kids make it to the parents, the fight doesn't exactly go according to plan. Like, the kids win, but it's only Alex and Carolina left standing. Nico was actually frozen by her own parents towards the beginning of the fight. Alex turns around to Carolina and is like, hey, can you unfreeze Nico? And Carolina goes over to Nico 
and then Alex hits Carolina around the head, knocking her out. And then Alex unfreezes Nico with the staff of one. It's here that he reveals that he was the mole working for the pride and he was on the pride side this entire time. So it turns out that Alex found out about the pride about a year before the series started. He knew that the pride were working for these ancient gods called the Gibberim, but he also found out about how other members of the pride wanted to harm his own parents and Nico's parents. So he decided to manipulate all the kids into to taking out the pride so Nico and their two families could take all six of the slots for the pride in the Giverim's paradise. Nico would turn against him, call him a psycho, another fight would break out. This time, Molly destroys the container with Destiny's soul in it. This causes a giant explosion. The Marine Bavarium is slowly collapsing. The Giverim turn up and are like, hey, where is our soul? Alex's father starts begging for forgiveness. Then Alex is like, you know what? Sorry, this whole thing's my fault. The Giverim destroy Alex like they don't even leave bones and the parents tell all the other kids to run away go and live their lives and the parents hold off the gibberim while the kids run as the kids get to the surface Captain America is there and all the kids are split up and are put into different homes Nico would actually be sent to father Flanagan's home for unwanted goth kids and one night when Nico was out she would run into her parents old rival Marie Laveau. Now Laveau wanted the black mirror which Nico's parents took but she needed Nico's blood to act the mirror. Nico, however, wanted the mirror for herself, so she allowed her blood to be taken, knowing that this would summon the Staff of One. The two of them would fight, and Nico would win, and she would use the mirror to try and bring back Alex, but this would fail, and the mirror would shatter. The issue is, Nico truly did fall in love with Alex. It was a teenage romance, and Nico would admit that this was a stupid thing for her to do later on, but at the time, she genuinely missed someone that she considered one of her best friends and was one of the only five other people in this world that could understand what she just went through. But she would meet up with all the other runaways after a few months and they would all sort of be like, our housing situation now is kind of shit. We hate this. So they would go and save Gertrude's dinosaur, go and take back their ship, the Leapfrog, and they would become runaways once again. This time hiding out in one of the Pride's bases under the La Brea Tar Pits. Nico would take on leadership of the team and the runaways wouldn't act as a superhero team. Like this is not a superhero book. And while the runaways would fight villains, they weren't doing this to save the day. They were doing this because with the absence of the Pride, who controlled LA's underbelly, there was now a power vacuum and loads of people were trying to clamor for that power. So the Runaways would basically fight to counteract this. Like they had no interest in being heroes, they were just doing something that they felt was their responsibility. So one day when they get back to their base, a future version of Gertrude appears before them. She says that the team has to find Victor Mancha and stop him from becoming the villain Victorious. The whole team's apprehensive at first, but Nico does a spell so she can see this future version of Gertrude's memories. She confirms that this is Gertrude, she is the leader of the Avengers, and she sees how the entire Avengers were taken out by Victor Mancha. Cut a long story short, the runaways find Victor, take him in for questioning, and it turns out his father might be Doctor Doom. But then it turns out his father is actually Ultron, and this was a Doom bot. Ultron would kill Victor's mother and start mind controlling Victor using some protocols that he built into Victor so he would try and kill the runaways, but Victor is able to resist this and Ultron would be destroyed. So Victor joins the team and chases like fully against Victor joining a team, but Nico's like, no, he can join the team, but if he tries anything bad against us, like if he tries turning against us even once, we rip his damn heart out. Following this, Nico would fall into the background quite a bit. She was more present to steer the reader emotionally through the books. So like at one point, Zavin turns up. Now Zavin is actually a scroll, And it turns out that Carolina was in an arranged marriage with Zavin and it was time for the two of them to get married so the Magistinians and the scrolls could stop warring. At first, Carolina resists and the runaways actually fight Zavin. But then eventually Carolina's like, look, I want to marry you because I want to stop this war. But at the same time, I'm gay, I can't marry a man. And Zavin's like, oh, is that it? And then he reveals sort of like gender and sex is non-existent for the scrolls because they can shapeshift. So that's not really a thing. So Carolina would go off into space to get married to Zavin and Nico feels like she's lost her best friend in the team. The marriage situation doesn't work out. Turns out the Magistinians and the scrolls just really like warring. So they'd be back 
quite quickly actually. They actually return in the middle of a crisis. So it turns out there's a new pride. There were Alex's online friends who had hacked into his computer and found out all of his information on the pride and all of his information on Nico's family's magic. So this new pride would cast a spell to try and bring back Alex, but they actually bring Alex's father forward in time. Following Alex's father's leadership, they would kidnap Molly. So the runaways go to save Molly and Nico runs in this room that has an anti-magic field. Alex's father shoots Nico, but this actually turns out to be Zavin shapeshifted into Nico. And while Alex's father was distracted with Zavin, the real Nico went and saved Molly. But then Zavin, while fighting Alex's father, loses control of his cosmic space powers and tortures the entire Griffith Observatory. Nico and Molly would run out, but Chase wasn't aware of this and seeing this fire thinks that Nico and Molly are still inside, runs inside to save the two of them and is then held captive by Alex's father. So Gertrude runs in to save Chase because the two of them have been dating at this point. She starts shit talking Alex's father and then Alex's father throws a knife right into Gertrude's heart. The fight ends after this. The runaways manage to defeat this new pride, sort of tell them what they've been doing because they were clearly unaware. And Nico decides that they're going to bury Gertrude's body next to the Hollywood sign. Chase on the other hand, who had been dating Gertrude, goes to the gibberim and is like, what would it take for you to bring Gertrude back. And they're just like, one innocent soul. That's all we need, one innocent soul. Chase would return to the team, but he's not quite himself. And this is very evident in Civil War, which happens right in the middle of the storyline. I'm not gonna get too into Civil War because it's really more of a young Avengers story. The runaways are just coincidentally in it. But I definitely recommend watching my History of Wiccan Redux video if you're interested in this storyline. Nico actually is quite proactive in this story. Like she doesn't do the main big end fight, but she does do this one spell where she's like, everyone chill out and she ends up turning their base into the frozen tundra by accident. But it was a really cool spell, like it was a really cool panel. A few days after this, Chase would tie up Nico, take the staff of one, take old lace and would be like, I'm gonna go to the gibberim and sacrifice myself. If someone is sacrificed to the gibberim, they're basically erased from existence. So he thinks if the staff of one and old Lace are also erased, it will give Nico and Gertrude a chance at a normal life. But when he gets there, the Gibberim are like, well, what the hell are you doing? We can't take a willing soul and you're a willing soul. So then the runaways turn up thinking that they're going to save Chase, but then the Gibberim are like, okay, we'll take the Minoru girl. And Victor has to save Nico and a massive fight breaks out. And obviously the runaways aren't strong enough to defeat the Gibberim, but they manage to hold them off for the 10 minutes minutes the Gibberim have remaining until they fade out of existence forever. Victor would actually want to kick Chase out of the group for this, but Nico's like, no, but if he tries anything like this again, we rip his damn heart out. The team would go to their base under the La Brea tar pits, and when they get there, Iron Man is already there waiting to arrest them for not registering in the Superhuman Registration Act. But I don't really even think they knew that they had to register. Like, I'm gonna be honest, the Runaways don't have time to be paying attention to superhero quarrels because they're not superheroes. I honestly believe Civil War happened to them and the Young Avengers probably forgot to warn them about registering. And the Runaways were like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. We don't care, we just, want to live our lives. So following this, we have Joss Whedon's run of The Runaways and it was not good. I'm gonna really quickly go over it because no one should have to spend more time on this than necessary. So the Runaways would run away to New York and Nico, acting as the team leader, would make a deal with Kingpin. Basically, he would supply the Runaways with shelter and food in exchange for them stealing something for him. They would steal the thing, which turns out to be a device called the Overdrive, which can be plugged into their ship, the Leapfrog. They would be attacked by the Punisher and Kingpin's army of ninjas and seeing no other choice would plug the Overdrive into their ship, hoping that it does something and they would find themselves time displaced in 1907. Here, Nico is quickly kidnapped and brought to a woman called Witchbreaker, who turned out to be Nico's great grandmother, and she would start torturing Nico, as if Nico can withstand more pain, it means she can use stronger magic. We don't know how Nico escaped. Like, she just escapes. And even in the Marvel Encyclopedia, it's just like, oh, she escaped. Like, it's never addressed in the comic. It's never addressed after the comic. We don't know. And it's so frustrating. This run was so bad, like so bad overall. It had so many plot holes, but this is by far one of the biggest ones. But she would gain new powers, like being able to fly and her spells were more complicated than before. Also, she had Witchbreaker staff instead of the original staff of one. It's also worth noting Victor and Nico had been dating, but this would essentially end in this run because Victor falls for another girl in the past. Regardless, the run 
runaways would find a way to return to the present, and they would bring a young girl called Clara with them, who was a mutant from the past. But upon returning to LA, the Magisteinian Light Brigade would turn up, and they would want to arrest Carolina for her parents' crimes against Magistein. Zavin, wanting to protect her wife, would turn around to Carolina and be like, I'm going to shapeshift into you and take your place. And she did exactly that, and we have never seen Zavin again since. We don't really know what happened to Zavin, whether she was just arrested or whether she was executed, but everyone on the team's heart was broken because every possibility probably went over their minds. Later, Monk Thepi would cast a spell that turned everyone in LA that had ever had plastic surgery into a zombie. Nico would try undoing this by casting a spell, Zombie Knot, but it turns all the zombies into a massive not of zombies. The staff would then be stolen by Monk Thepi, and then the staff would retaliate by flat out murdering him. So Nico would warn all the other runaways to never touch the staff again. Like she was the only one that was allowed to touch it. Because keep in mind, Alex had touched it in the past, Chase had touched it. Like before it was really passed around, but since Witchbreaker had tortured her, no one else had touched it until that moment. So clearly the staff was a lot more unpredictable now. Eventually, to give the team a sense of normality, Nico would host a prom for all of them. Victor would actually be given the task of finding music for the prom. He would end up tapping into a naval air weapons base, and this causes an aircraft to crash right into their home that they had been staying in. This would destroy the home, obviously, kill Old Lace, and destroy the Leapfrog. Clara gets buried under rubble, which causes her powers to freak out, so Nico has to cast a spell to basically knock Clara out to calm her down. And then Chase is freaking out about the fact that Old Lace is dead, and that was basically the only thing of Gertrude he had left. So Nico, to try and stop confrontation amongst the team, sends Old Lace's body to another dimension. While this is all going on, the military turn up wanting to arrest the runaways for messing with military signals, which is kind of fair enough. But then Chase's uncle would turn up, who Chase believed was dead, so Chase starts freaking out again, and the uncle's like, look, I can take you to other ships. So he takes them to four other leapfrog ships. The runaways get a new leapfrog, this time it's one that can fly. And the military, not knowing the runaways have escaped, just burn down the house to be done with everything. So Old Lace, Gert's dinosaur, and she had a telepathic link, but before she died she transferred this telepathic link over to Chase. And Chase began to sense that Old Lace was alive, just trapped in another dimension, but Nico couldn't get Old Lace back. So they go to Hank Pym and they're like, can you take us to this other dimension to get Old Lace back? And Pym at first is like, I'm not sure, but then he helps them. While in this other dimension, Nico would cast a spell on her own to find out what Pym and Tigra were up to because they were being uncharacteristically trustworthy. And she would find out that Pym and Tigra planned to separate the runaways, basically taking Molly and Clara away from them. A huge fight would break out and it would end when Nico uses a spell to try and understand the Avengers Academy staff and for the Avengers Academy staff to understand the runaways. And it turns out every single person there just wants to keep their family together. Like that's the one thing they all have in common. So Hank Pym strikes a deal with the runaways. They just have to report into the Academy every so often to prove that they're not dead. And the runaways agree to this because they don't plan on dying. But following this, Nico would be one of 16 superpowered teenagers taken to Murder World. Basically, think of this as Hunger Games of superpowers. All of these kids were forced to kill each other in order to survive. The only friend she had there was Chase, but guess what Chase doesn't have? superpowers or old lace with him. So that means he's kind of useless in this situation, let's be real. At first they'll try teaming up with the Avengers kids, but the Avengers kids reject them. They would then team up with the Braddock Academy kids. Chase had found the Darkhawk amulet during this time. But then they would find out that Tim Bashir actually shared a body with Katie Bashir, who everyone wanted gone. It was because Katie had the power to control technology and wasn't exactly good. And a lot of the people there did rely on technology to be able to have properly use their powers and abilities. Like, like technology is an important thing for a lot of them. It reached a point where everyone voted on whether Tim could stay or whether they were going to kill him off. And pretty much everyone other than Chase votes on Tim being allowed to stay. But Chase would take matters on his own hands, use the Dark Hawk amulet and go to kill Tim. So Nico steps in and personally gets rid of Chase. Like she doesn't kill him, she just like gets rid of him. That night, another fight would break out. Tim would revert back into Katie and kill off off several people. The following morning, Katie had actually started to control Chase in his Dark Hawk amulet, because the Dark Hawk armor is all technology, so it basically means Katie had the ability to brainwash Chase. She had Chase rip off Nico's arm, 
push her down a cliff and Nico is crawling towards the broken staff of one at this point because her deepest, darkest fear is coming true. Her deepest fear is dying alone and she does not want to die alone. She's bleeding out, like there is blood all over the snow. She reaches out to the staff and the only thing she can do as she holds onto the staff is quietly cry for help as she dies. But the staff of one responds to the blood that Nico has just let out and uses this to create a spell. It revives Nico from the dead, reforms itself, so half of it is still the staff, and the other half of it is a new arm for Nico. Nico's magic is more powerful than it's ever been because her staff is now a physical part of her. She would go and attack Katie, Deathlocket, and Chase, destroy Chase's armor, and bury Katie and Deathlocket alive. After this, there's these two really heartbreaking frames where Chase is like begging for forgiveness and Nico's like, Chase, just be quiet. Can we please just, just sit here and pretend that none of this is happening? And I remember reading this for the first time and being like, Jesus Christ, that would be me. Following this, Nico would have one more fight, this time with Cammy, who had taken Chase's Darkhawk armor with Chase's consent, because it like repaired itself. And it was also she could reason with Nico to stop her from killing Cullen. But Nico would see the Darkhawk armor not on Chase, think that Chase has been harmed, would freak out even more. And the fighting would only stop when Hazmat goes out of control, so everyone has to turn their attention to Hazmat. And following this, everyone's like, hey, you know what's easier? Just not killing people. Like, not killing people is so much easier. But then there will be another fight with Katie, and Deathlocket is actually the one that kills Katie, so. That's that. I will say, Murder World, I personally find very compelling. I know a lot of people don't like it, but I really enjoy it. But because there's so many different points of views going on, it does rely heavily on context. Like, you need to read it for it to not sound goofy. So I definitely recommend reading it. I know it's all on Marvel Unlimited if you've got Marvel Unlimited. Later, Nico would be undercover in the town of villains working for the Masters of Evil, and it turns out Alex Wilder has been resurrected, and it also turns out being in hell for quite a while makes you very proficient at magic. So Alex begins to train Nico on how to be even more proficient with her powers. To cut a long story short, he would train Nico and return to hell. Like, this whole thing could have just not even been in the story and it would be the exact same. Like, I'm not even exaggerating when that's it, because that is literally it. I love Nico and I liked seeing her in the story, but it was also ultimately a bit like, wh why? Why was she there? <laughs> so Nico is actually part of Battle World's A Force and Secret Wars, but this is like a different version of Nico. She just has the same powers as Nico, sort of a similar personality. She's a bit more mentally unstable. I will one day do a dedicated Battle World A Force video, but for now, we're just gonna focus on the mainstream Marvel universe. So a being called Singularity would be running away from a being called Antimatter. She would teleport Medusa, She-Hulk, and herself to Japan and crash Nico's cousin's wedding. They would explain to Nico that Antimatter was the polar opposite to Singularity and they needed the use of Nico's magic to help Singularity. And that's when Antimatter would turn up and Nico would send it away using the Staff of One. Dr. Tempest Bell would then get involved and say that they could actually use Singularity as bait to defeat antimatter using light particles, which is when Dazzler would get involved. Things eventually reached a point where the team had to fight antimatter in space, Dazzler was seemingly killed, so Singularity, feeling the loss of losing a teammate, would go to fight antimatter alone, which obviously she was gonna lose. That's when the team went to go and back Singularity up, Medusa would plant a bomb in antimatter while everyone else protected Singularity and would then run away as the bomb went off. Following this, the group would stay together until eventually Medusa would go into space, She-Hulk would quit being a hero. I don't even know what happened to Dazzler, but yeah, it was really sad because this team meant a lot to Nico. Like this was the first team since the Runaways that had accepted her and she hadn't really been a part of the Runaways since Murder World. But Chase had been messing around in the past to try and get Gert back. And eventually one day Nico wakes up and her arm is back to normal and the staff of one is back to its original form. And then Chase appears before her in his time machine with a dying Gert in his arms. And he's like, Nico, you need to help me stop Gertrude from dying. Like you need to help me. So she teleports 
reports in a doctor, with the help of the doctor, they managed to stop Gertrude from dying. Uh, we're not gonna get too much into that because that is the latest run of The Runaways and it's only like three issues in. I love Nico so much. She is such a good emotional guide for the reader, regardless of the book that she's in. She might not be the most proactive of characters, but you know which characters are always great? The emotional guides. I don't care what anyone says. They are always the standout ones for me. I'm excited to see the latest run of The Runaways. I want her powers to grow beyond what she can do currently because it is addressed. She's running out of spells. Like, she only knows so many words, and there are only so many words. So I'm excited to see where she's going in the comics. And I do think she's a strong enough character to tackle her own book. Like, she was the emotional guide in Murder World. She was the emotional guide in A-Force. She was the emotional guide in Runaways. Let's give her her own book. Like, she can handle it. And I would read the living hell out of that book. As for the TV show, I have done a video saying what I think of the TV show, but I think Lyrica Okana is doing an amazing job as Nico. I think this casting is perfect. She clearly cares about the character. I know she'd never read The Runaways before she was cast, but you can't tell. To me, it seems she has just as much passion for this character as someone that's been reading the comics since 2003. So she's doing a fantastic job and I can't wait to see what else she does with the character in future seasons. Like, maybe she'll go over into Jessica Jones, maybe she'll cross over into other things, I don't know, but I really want to see where this goes because she's doing such a good job. It's super effective! Okay guys, that is it for today. So what do you think of Nico in the comics and in the show? Please let me in the comments down below. Also, don't forget to thumbs up, subscribe to all of my show's links. Check out my Patreon if you want to support the show. But for now, my name is Faust. This has been Exploring Comics and it is super effective.